Welcome back. We now turn to um, chapters 10 and 11 of the Harris Plessner textbook, in which we now will discuss um, the heroes and heroines who uh, confront death and other um, uh, evils and difficulties uh, in human society and sometimes the world at large uh, in their quest for immortality or uh, goodness or whatever else um, <clears throat> might, might be the, ob the object of their desire. Now, the first thing I would like you to do is uh, pause your video for a moment and turn in your Dowden textbook um, to the end of chapter 8. Please get your uh, Dowden textbook out, pause your video, and turn to the end of chapter 8. Are you there? Okay. Uh, you will see there a list of uh, descriptions of the steps in a hero story. You may remember back in our video on uh, uh, chapter two uh, that we discussed the uh, theme of mythic interpretation called uh, narratology, which suggested that there were themes, patterns, um, re uh, repetitious uh, elements of the story that would uh, make up a hero story in particular, but could probably make up uh, practically any kind of myth, legend, fairy story in general, that the, that the common themes would always uh, uh, carry one through. So what you have here um, in these depictions is that the uh, the particular heroes, let's get it a little closer so you can see them better, the particular heroes that you uh, have here, as well as the heroines described in chapters 10 and 11 of the textbook, uh, you'll notice have a lot of similarities among them, and then some interesting differences in order to set them all apart. So um, it's not surprising, therefore, that, for instance, Heracles and Theseus have some uh, common elements to them because, of course, um, if you look carefully at um, the stories of Heracles, which uh, who is Spartan-based, and Theseus, who is Athenian-based but is mimicked after uh, Heracles, that uh, both of them come from the same kind of heroic type of background uh, with uh, being separated from their parents, orphaned, uh, undergoing some kind of, of, of childhood trauma or difficulty, having to go and find parents um, or not having the parents at all, having to go through quests, have, uh, getting into, into difficulties, having to, to prove oneself and so on. Um, it's really the same kind of pattern that's going to happen with, with, with practically any, any uh, story. So, um, so the uh, uh, layout of the hero story you can see easily both in um, chapter 10 of, of your Harris Plaster textbook as well as the end of chapter 8 in your Dowden textbook, you'll see that there are parallels, and it's, it's, it's insightful to see uh, the the, um, uh, the heroic um, pattern laid out that way. And you, I'm sure you can think, think of many other examples of the, of the heroic par paradigm in, in later mythologies. Okay, so let's talk about these uh, individually. I won't spend a great deal of time on any one of them, but we'll, once, as, as usual, we'll uh, talk about each of them um, as an overview in order to fill in uh, what you have in the textbook. So what the first impression that you should have from these heroes is that none of them is actually that great. Uh, Heracles, in particular, is depicted uh, often as a glutton in Greek comedy. Uh, he, all he wants to do when he's not out adventuring or swashbuckling or grabbing women is to just simply eat and drink all the time. So that's Heracles. Um, Theseus um, certainly is impressive in the way that he went up to the Minotaur, but the way that he um, brought about the death of his father inadvertently to then become king of Athens certainly doesn't uh, give him much in the way of uh, uh, a strong uh, standing. Odysseus uh, is, has somewhat higher claims to respectability, but did dabble here and there with women. Also, of course, uh, brings about the death of his crewmen by his carelessly uh, giving his name away uh, to the Cyclops, as you'll see um, in the Odyssey at, uh, in our next uh, video. So he has his problems. And Jason, there's very little good to say about him, as you will see. Whereas the women often come off as blameless, innocent, and helpless. Frequently, the women simply do not have a way to assert themselves uh, effectively in a male society. And when they try to they end up committing grave crimes that uh, discredit uh, their reputations um, and usually lead to some type of tragic outcome. So it's very hard to be either a hero or a heroine. Uh, in, the, in the end, neither one really comes out looking that great. So let's review some of the individual stories. Uh, in the case of Heracles, um, his um, birth, of course, is quite interesting uh, because he is yet again a uh, uh, bastard son of uh, Zeus. 
Uh, he gets almost killed in the crib by two snakes sent by Hera, but then he grabs hold of both of them and strangles them while his stupid uh, infant uh, brother, uh, Iphicles, just sits there and cries and screams. Uh, Heracles, the big hero, just sort of picks up these two toys and goes and squeezes them. So uh, Heracles is already a hero. So uh, he has a few misadventures, like killing his music teacher and so forth. And then a madness is sent upon him by Hera, and he ends up killing his wife and children. And that's what uh, spawns his most famous group of, of um, uh, uh, myths, which are the originally 10 labors, which then get uh, extended into 12 labors, according to Apollodorus, because two of the labors um, ended up with problems and they got um, disallowed. So Heracles ended up, in fact, uh, carrying out 12 labors, and uh, th thereby he was able to work off the, um, uh, the, the uh, unfortunate murder of his family. Um, after uh, he carried out the 12 labors, that's what, of course, uh, elevated him to uh, herohood. Um, unfortunately, uh, he ended up um, taking a rather uh, tragic uh, turn for the worse because he invaded a city in southern Greece called Oikalia, and uh, he sent the uh, woman uh, whom he was in love with there, and was actually the reason why he invaded the city, uh, Iole, the daughter of the king, um, home to Trachis, where his wife, Dea Nera, was waiting for him. Now, Dea Nera has a kind of interesting story of her own uh, as, as to how she and Heracles got together. Heracles got Dea Nera because Heracles wrestled her father, Achilleos, the river god, down and actually broke off his horn. Uh, that's the famous horn of plenty that, that we have from uh, Greek mythology today. So, uh, as a result, Heracles gained Dea Nera as his wife. He then was carrying her home to Trachis and came to a river, the Nemea River. And when he got there, uh, he was confronted by the river uh, uh, centaur Nessus, who invited um, Heracles to let him carry uh, Deonera across on his back. Unfortunately, in the middle of the water, he turned around and tried to rape her. Heracles then, from a distance, shot um, the centaur with uh, his poisoned arrows, poisoned with the blood of the Hydra, um, a monster he had killed earlier during his uh, 12 labor phase. And uh, Nessus collapsed in the river. And as Deonera leaned over him, he whispered to Deonera to take his blood, that it would be a love potion should Her uh, Heracles ever go astray. So Deonera, in fact, uh, collected this blood together and had it available for her. Now, what happens next? Heracles, after lots of adventures, um, ends up now getting hold of this woman, Ioli, and sending her home. So, Ioli ends up at the, on the doorstep of Deonera, and of course she panics. What is Heracles, her husband, up to? So, she sends Heracles a special robe, all daubed with this um, blood of the centaur, thinking that that will be her way of getting him back to be faithful to her. Of course, what instead happens is that when he puts on the robe, um, he then uh, lights a fire uh, in order to carry out a sacrifice, and the poison begins seeping into his skin and finally ends up burning him alive. He ends up suffering a very torturous death on a pyre uh, lit by um, a, a man named uh, Philoctetes, and it's actually Philoctetes, uh, who is part of the uh, Greek army at Troy, who gets Heracles' special bow that is unerring for uh, shooting game. Uh, and so, uh, in that way, Heracles ends up dying. So Heracles has kind of a mixed uh, life as far as being a hero or not. But one thing that is special about him is that although his body and soul went down to the underworld, he himself was actually elevated to Mount Olympus. And so he ends up becoming um, an Olympian god. And he marries uh, Zeus and Hera's wife, uh, daughter, uh, Hebe, uh, the goddess of youth. Whereupon Hera, at long last, becomes Heracles' mother-in-law. Let's hope that Heracles is eternally grateful uh, to have uh, her uh, finally on his side, right? <laughs> okay, that's Heracles. Theseus, you ho hopefully know from the story of the Minotaur. Uh, Theseus actually himself has an interesting story prior to that because um, he was born away from Athens where his father Aegeus was king. And when he grew up, uh, he was told by his mother Aithra that he had to lift a particular uh, stone up in order to get um, a sword uh, from, out from underneath it. 
when he was finally able to lift the stone up and get the sword, see, sword in the stone, then he goes to Athens. But instead of taking the easy sea route to Athens, apparently envying uh, the reputation of uh, the Spartan uh, hero Heracles, he chooses to go voluntarily by land from Troyston all the way around Athens, where there were all sorts of monsters and various obstacles, um, uh, strangers who will get in his way and try to kill him. And so he meets a whole bunch of them, uh, the pine bender and uh, the one with a club, Procrustes, the famous one who would stretch people on a bed if they were too short or cut them off if they were, they were too long and so forth. And so he's able to defeat all of them and eventually um, he arrives uh, in uh, Athens. The only problem is that his father Aegeus has taken up with a certain woman named Medea who is already in asylum for murder of her own children. When uh, Theseus shows up, Medea recognizes him, even though Aegeus doesn't, and plans to kill him by poisoning a cup of wine. Theseus sits down um, at the dinner table when he arrives, at this point as a guest, and uh, Aegeus offers him wine and also offers him the opportunity to, to cut some meat. Theseus is about to, to uh, drink uh, from some wine, but then he takes out his sword to get ready to cut some meat, and all of a sudden Aegeus recognizes the sword and strikes away the uh, cup because he was in fact complicit on the, the plot to kill Theseus. Whereupon Medea disappears in a puff of smoke but without cursing both Aegeus and Theseus. So Theseus turns out well that way and he goes uh, later to Crete um, when the tribute time comes uh, to uh, the Cretan king Minos. Um, Theseus uh, substitutes in for one of the young men so that he can infiltrate the labyrinth. He does so with the aid of Minos' daughter Ariadne, who's down here. Unfortunately, when Theseus leaves Crete, uh, he takes Ariadne with him on the ship, but then abandons her on an island on the way home to Athens, whereupon, according to the Roman poet Catullus, she curses him. Now, the arrangement that had been made between Theseus and his father Aegeus was that the, the ship had to go to Crete um, with a black sail. The black sail was a sail of mourning, which also would keep pirates away. Theseus was told to change the sail from black to white, the more typical sailing color, in order to indicate to Aegeus upon his arrival home that he had in fact survived. However, because of the curse put up on him, Theseus forgot to change the sail, and Aegeus ended up uh, from extending from a cliff, seeing the, the boat coming in and saw the black sail and thought that meant that Theseus had died and threw himself over uh, the cliff and killed himself. So that was how Theseus ended up becoming king of Athens in a, in a, in a rather unfortunately disgraceful way. And actually Theseus' death was, was rather ignominious. He was actually pushed off a cliff uh, eventually himself. So he actually met the same death as his, as his father. So Theseus too, like Heracles, has a mixture. And in both cases, mistreatment of women uh, figures into the occasion. Odysseus, of course, um, is a quite a different hero um, who is be better known for his cunning than his physical strength. Uh, we'll save a uh, discussion uh, of, of him more when we uh, come to um, uh, Odyssey, but the main thing to be, to, that is distinctive about um, uh, Odysseus is his ability to rely on his wit rather than his strength. He is faithful to Penelope, but unfortunately, uh, with, with, in, in, with his carelessness, as we said before, he costs uh, the death of his um, fellow men, and he ends up arriving home uh, completely alone. And the only reason why he arrives home is that he has uh, an oracle that declares his fate that he will arrive home, and he also has the protection of um, the goddess of wisdom, uh, Athena. So more about him to come up uh, in, in the next video on chapters uh, 12 and 13. Jason, hmm, we're going to see more of when we read um, uh, your pieces play Medea, but Jason is pretty much an anti-hero. Um, he's cowardly, uh, he built the Argo, but he's scared to death of having to sail on it. So he gets the most uh, powerful people around him in order to go with him, including actually Heracles, although Heracles ends up abandoning him along the way. And Theseus is down in the underworld, actually. Theseus committed a crime of going down into the, into the underworld with his friend Perithous because they thought it would be really cool to steal the bride uh, Persephone from Hades. They get caught down there. Um, Hades invites them both to, to uh, sit for dinner and because um, he knows what's going on. And they're stuck in chairs um, where, where they sit. Uh, they can't get out. And Prometheus, when he comes down to the underworld, um, eventually uh, ends up actually freeing um, uh, uh, Theseus. 
Uh, so um, there you go. Now, Jason has, as we say, quite a few heroes, except for Heracles and Theseus, uh, to accompany him on the Argo to go in and fetch the Golden Fleece. He's doing so with the help of the gods because uh, his uncle Peleus has taken away uh, the command of Iolcus, Jason's home city, from um, uh, Jason's father, Aeson. So the, the gods want to punish Peleus because Peleus did, failed to sacrifice to Hera uh, during a prior sacrifice, and Hera wants to punish uh, Peleus. So Jason gets protection of the gods to get over to the Golden Fleece. Then he meets Medea, the king of the, uh, sorry, the queen, sorry, the daughter of the um, uh, king of, of uh, Colchis named Aetes. Medea falls in love with Jason and helps him to get the uh, fleece by sprinkling a poison on the uh, dragon that's guarding the fleece to put him to sleep. And as a result, uh, Medea finally uh, gets Jason out of Col Colchis and um, on a, 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 some more misadventures, eventually back to Thessaly. Uh, Medea, however, uh, engineers the slaughter of the king Peleus uh, with the help of the 12 daughters of Peleus by convincing uh, them to cut Peleus's body up and, and drop it into a, um, a huge pot of boiling water, whereupon with a, a proper medicine added in, Peleus would spring back to life as a young man. Uh, in fact, that was not the case. It was a scam. And that's how Peleus ended up getting killed. So as a result, Medea and Jason got into exile. They fled to Corinth, and it was there fatally that Jason fell in love with the um, princess of the uh, king of, of uh, Corinth and ended up deserting Medea. By that time, they already had two boys, and Medea ended up killing uh, the two children as a way of punishing Jason and also sent a golden robe and crown daubed with poison uh, to um, uh, Jason's new bride as a uh, wedding gift, and she put them both on and ended up getting burned alive uh, with both of them. So uh, Medea, of course, falls down here. So, uh, so effectively, Jason um, really does not come out well as a hero, uh, despite the fact that he carries out the typical actions of a hero. Really, the only reason why he gets to um, Colchis and back to Iolcus is because of the protection of several gods as an uh, instrument of, of the punishment of Jason's uncle Peleus. Once that's been resolved, the uh, goddesses have no more use for Jason, and uh, once he has to live his life as a regular person, he completely messes it up. Uh, as, as it turns out. So that's Jason. So in all, as you can see, um, Greek heroes uh, are quite imperfect as people go. And one unfortunate effect of heroes when they visit a place is frequently they have adverse effects on the places where they visit. Jason not only disturbed uh, Colchis by his arrival there, uh, bringing um, Medea away, leading to the death of Medea's brother Absurdus, whom Jason killed, uh, they, they scattered the body parts in the water to stop Aetes, the father, from chasing after them. So that happened. Um, but also along the way, Jason passed a place called Sisychus. Uh, he landed there and was welcomed in hospitably. Sisychus has an unusual geographic feature where, where it's a loop like this uh, on the southern coast of the Black Sea. When Jason left to, and continued east, a storm inadvertently blew him back to Sisychus. And when he landed there the second time on the other side, um, the people of Sisychus thought he was a stranger and attacked him. And in the course of um, the battle that ensued, the king was killed. And, and the daughter of the king named Plate uh, ended up um, committing suicide. So Jason ended up inadvertently disturbing the area where he, where he visited, especially one that had originally welcomed him in, in hospitably. So that's often what happens with, uh, with these places. Of course, the Cyclops Polyphemus ended up blind. Um, because Odysseus uh, came calling. So heroes, again, often have disruptive effects on the places uh, where they visit. So now, who suffers the consequences of what the heroes do? Why the heroines, of course. So Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, going off with Menelaus, king of Sparta, to Troy, sacrifices his daughter Iphigenia. When he arrives home, he takes a bath, and it becomes a bloodbath, and that's his wife, Clytemnestra, who does that. So Clytemnestra, of course, is acting on behalf of uh, her own um, violated womanhood, essentially, in the sense that she's de uh, deserted this way. And also uh, because uh, Agamemnon also has a trophy, Cassandra from Troy, just like Heracles' trophy, Iole. Uh, so there's that, and also the murder of their daughter. 
So Clytemnestra carries out a murder against Agamemnon. In doing so, she steps out of place, and she's depicted pretty consistently as a villain, although both Sophocles and Euripides surprisingly make Clytemnestra a somewhat more sympathetic figure in their two plays, both called Electra, and Electra is Clytemnestra's daughter. Nonetheless, though, in all versions, Clytemnestra ends up being um, herself killed uh, by Orestes and Electra, usually teamed up together. Also, Orestes' friend Pylades is, is involved as well. The three of them work together to bring uh, Clytemnestra down, as well as Clytemnestra's lover, uh, Agamemnon's cousin Aegisthus, who was born um, uh, as an illegitimate son from the prior generation of the House of Atreus. So all of that together makes Clytemnestra a, a very unpleasant woman. And as such, um, although she could be uh, of heroic st uh, stature because she stepped out of uh, her role as, as woman, in fact, uh, her, her uh, uh, role of, of uh, murderess makes her disqualified as, um, as someone that, that we can uh, uh, accept. So that's Clytemnestra. Medea we've already talked about. Medea is similarly villainous in the way that she uh, punishes Jason and, again, is depicted that way pretty savagely in Euripides' play. Um, on the other hand, of course, you have the, the real victims. Ariadne, abandoned by Theseus. Eventually, she is rescued by Dionysus and brought up to Mount Olympus, and her crown becomes a uh, constellation, Corona Borealis. But still, that was a rotten thing uh, for Theseus to do to Ariadne, especially after she had helped him uh, to um, kill her actually half-brother, uh, the, uh, the Minotaur, as it, as it turns out. Um, so that's Ariadne. Uh, there are other victims, too. There's Phaedra, Ariadne's sister, who is married to, to, uh, is to Theseus later in life. But uh, Theseus actually um, ends up cursing um, his own son, Hippolytus, because Phaedra is driven mad by Aphrodite um, to punish Hippolytus, because Hippolytus refused to worship Aphrodite and instead was worshiping only Artemis, the hunt goddess. So Phaedra becomes the instrument of... Um, uh, Hippolytus' destruction. So in a way, she's kind of a half-victim, half-villain uh, um, in a uh, Greek tragedy. Um, there is Penelope, uh, quite a unique figure in uh, a Greek myth. Penelope is the woman who stays at home chastely and keeps the household safe until eventually Odysseus is able to arrive home. She is the one who performs the clever trick of weaving a shroud for uh, it's either Odysseus or Odysseus's father, and then taking it all apart um, at night. And not until eventually the, the men discover what she's doing uh, is she finally compelled to pick out a, a suitor among among the group of suitors as her new husband. Luckily, she has in fact stalled just long enough for Odysseus to arrive home with the help of uh, the protecting goddess Athena. And Odysseus is able to finally get his way back into his into his homestead and reclaim um, his, um, his his throne and his home and his wife all together uh, near, near the end of, uh, of uh, the Odyssey. So Penelope um, is really a remarkable woman, and uh, she waits for a very long time for her husband to arrive home. Catullus, the Roman poet, however, is a little um, uh, less certain of Penelope's uh, willingness to wait so long, Penelope is a lot more agitated about Odysseus's absence in that uh, uh, poem, the letter that she writes to, um, to uh, Odysseus, than uh, the Penelope who waits so patiently uh, in Homer's Odyssey. And then we finally have one final Roman myth, Psyche. And although the story probably existed in Greek mythology, uh, it's in the Roman version given to us by Apuleius, the golden ass, where the story of Psyche is, is, is headed down to us fully. Uh, so so it, it's, pro it's probably appropriate to think of it as, as close to, to an original Roman myth as we have. Psyche um, is the most beautiful and youngest of three daughters. Um, her beauty is compared to Venus. Oops, Venus is angry. So Psyche uh, is going to be, um, uh, was originally going to be condemned to death, but eventually uh, does actually get married to someone. Only, the only problem is that she's not allowed to see her husband. And so Psyche's two sisters uh, welcome her to her house regularly, and they keep on asking questions about this husband, and they finally tell her, wait a minute, you need to show, uh, let, make him show him in your, your, her, his true form. Sound familiar? Um, and so Psyche... In, uh, tries to get her husband to do that, but her husband won't do it. So finally one night, Psyche takes a lamp 
and holds the lamp over him, and it turns out to be the god Cupid, but she's so startled by that that she drops oil on his shoulder, and it burns him, and so he flies away. So Psyche ends up um, trying to grab onto him, but eventually he lets go of her, and she drops, and she is unconscious. Uh, then she is brought to Venus. Venus insists on this, and then Venus sets Psyche some tasks, such as... Um, have, having a huge pile of grain and having to separate all the grains, having to climb up a, a, a cliff in order to get some water, and then finally having to go down into the underworld to get some of uh, Persephone's beauty. So you notice that in each of these cases, Persephone, I'm sorry, Psyche is given a woman's task, uh, like grain, like water fetching, and, now, and then also something associated with Persephone's beauty. When Psyche gets the box of beauty, she actually opens the box just like um, uh, Pandora, and she falls into a deep sleep. Uh, the way she's able to get past the other tasks is, is that she gets human help. I'm sorry, divine help. She gets, um, well, I, there's an ant that comes and separates all the grains for her, and an eagle, the um, uh, the bird of, of uh, Jupiter, comes along and, and flies up to the to the uh, top of the mountain to get the, um, the, the bucket of water filled. So she keeps getting uh, help along the way. But finally, when she's put to sleep, she doesn't get any more help until finally Cupid, who has forgiven Psyche, finally appeals to Jupiter, and at last, Psyche is forgiven and is brought uh, up, up to the above world, and at last, she and Venus are able to reconcile. And once again, we have a mother-in-law. Psyche marries Cupid, and Venus is her mother-in-law, just like Hera was Heracles' mother-in-law. There's something about mother-in-law in these stories. Do you notice? I'm not so sure that it is, it is all that much fun to be a Greek hero, if that's uh, the, fi the final uh, uh, fate one has to look forward to. In any event, that's a quick run through of the uh, Greek gods and heroes uh, and heroines given to you uh, in chapters 10 and 11. In our next uh, uh, video, we will look at chapters uh, uh, 12 and 13, in which we will discuss Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, the, the, uh, the, the two great epics that depict the tragic occurrences in the Trojan War and uh, the uh, subsequent uh, journey home uh, of Odysseus. We'll see you next video.